Hey, how's everybody doing? This is Mr. Arvitus back with another coronavirus history lesson. This one is going to be about the Nazi push across Europe. This is Hitler's invasion of Poland all the way through France. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, obviously, the prelude going up. Could this have been stopped? And then how do the Nazis seemingly just destroy every army in their wake during the 1939-1940 campaign? Uh, a lot of this is going to be instituted into luck. Uh, we're going to displace some of the normal misnomers that people say, which is usually just numerous American insults to the French. So let's get started. Well, I think we really have to kind of look to 1935. That's when Hitler rearms the German army. And this was a violation, clear violation of the Versailles Treaty. A lot of people tend to say that Britain and France could have stopped Hitler now. And by all measures, they probably could have if they had invaded Germany. But the problem with that is that Britain and France are democracies, right? And so they don't have the ability to just go to war whenever they want. Maybe Joseph Stalin could have, and he probably could have beaten Hitler in 1935 because the German army just simply wasn't as big as it will be by 1939. But none of these powers want to go to war. Keep in mind, we're in the midst of a global depression. And if you're a British politician or a French politician, you have to be democratically elected. And keep in mind that World War I is not that long ago, right? 1935, you're talking World War I ended in 1919. So this is not a long time. This is not a like distant memory. A lot of the people who vote heavily, a lot of these politicians were in World War I. So there was simply no desire to go back to World War I. Now, Hitler won't stop with just rearming the military. Obviously, that also institutes uh, building the Luftwaffe, which he named Hermann Goring in charge of. It also institutes creating a navy, including U-boats, which the Germans had actually already been doing. Uh, but the other thing that he's going to do that really kind of makes a big difference is in April of 1936, Hitler is going to order the German army to march into the Rhineland. And this is actually an interesting point of no return because Hitler doesn't quite know what the French are going to do. And it's kind of a risky political move. He had s numerous advisors who advised against doing this because they didn't know if the French would attack or not. Well, the French in no mood for a war are going to remove themselves from the Rhineland uh, within hours of the German army coming in. And so war is averted there. Now, if you're wondering why Hitler is so immensely popular, that's because by 1935, 36, and then into 1937, Germany is in an economic boom when the rest of Europe is not. And so Hitler is immensely popular. You have politicians in the United States who celebrate Hitler, politicians in Britain who celebrate Hitler. And so he is actually growing in popularity as we go forward. And you can even look at that as in 1936, Berlin hosted the Olympics. And of course, when we think of the Berlin Olympics from the United States perspective, obviously we think of Jesse Owens uh, you know, winning in the, in the track meets and kind of showing that you know, African-Americans are and will be always equal to anyone else. And, and so I think you know, for us as Americans, the Berlin Olympics was kind of a showcase and for African-Americans especially more so. But for Hitler, the Berlin Olympics was showcasing his army. You know, They marched on in, in into the stadiums in Berlin. They showcased that our that they were developing. And you know, there was that idea of the Aryan race, right? The super soldier and all these other types of things that they were talking about. And so when Jesse Owens, right, an African-American, someone who in Hitler's Germany was an undesirable, who could be put to death, who wouldn't be allowed to have rights, when he goes in and wins you know, the 100 meter dash and numerous other track events, it's kind of a big deal. And it's a big showcase. It's also one of the first times where you know, for Americans, we put an African-American at the forefront of our culture and he gets cheered on regardless of of race. Now, we could talk all day about the things that happened to Jesse Owens when he comes back from the, the Berlin Olympics because a lot of those athletes, especially those African-American ones, are going to find themselves unemployed right after. But, you know, the Berlin Olympics also mark another turning point. 1936 is when Hitler makes a deal with Benito Mussolini, and that's the Pact of Steel. Uh, they formed the Rome-Berlin Axis in 1936. This was illegal according to the Versailles Treaty. Germany was not supposed to have any military or economic alliances with people, and they formed that in 1936. And and so Hitler is kind of dancing around the nuanced parts of the treaty right now. Uh, he's going to trample it in another year or so. So by 1937, 38, Hitler is kind of just growing in power, growing in power. And, and that's when he kind of tramples on it. Also keep in mind, in 1935, you had the Nuremberg Laws get passed, which were anti-Jewish laws. And so the Nazi state is full-fledged anti-Semitic. They're outlawing Jewish businesses from participating, outlawing Jewish uh 
athletes from participating in the Olympics. And we actually have a, new, a number of American athletes who are Jewish that do not get sent. Uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee decides to not send Jews to the Olympics uh, because they didn't want to upset Adolf Hitler. And some people argue this is one of the biggest slights that we've ever seen by our Olympic Committee. Um, but, you know, that's, that's either here nor there. Now, as we move forward, right, Hitler begins to just continuously rearm Germany. And, and so we're talking about a troop buildup. And rearming is a lot more complicated than it sounds. So understand that you have to train all these soldiers. And we talk about an invasion of Poland that will be 1.1 million soldiers, one of the largest invasions in human history. These are soldiers who are being trained at this point in time. They're also outfitting a new type of army. I think that's important to understand. Their Luftwaffe and their tanks, the Panzer Corps, right? These are going to be the, the fundamental principles of the German Blitz, and they're revolutionizing the way war is being fought. Other countries are doing similar things, but the Germans tend to be at the forefront of how this is going to be. And we do see America is going to borrow a lot of the tactics we use are going to be German Blitz tactics once we get into Europe. And so that's something that's kind of important to recognize. Now, Hitler makes a call to the fatherland, right? He wants all Germans to return home. That includes Germans who live in the United States. That includes Germans abroad. And Hitler begins to openly talk about annexing German territories. And that means historical German territories. When we think historical German territories, we're talking Austria and Czechoslovakia or present day Czech Republic and Slovakia. And so that's what Hitler is kind of looking at, right? He wants to take away the, these German territories. Now, why does he want it? You have to just look at Mein Kampf. If you look at Mein Kampf, he talks about it, written all the way back in 1923, right? Uh, Produced in 24. Hitler says he needs these lands. You need steel production. You need coal production out of Czechoslovakia. He wants Austria for the culture, for the German history, and for a boost in military, as well as the natural resources that Austria possessed as well. You know, he looked at Poland, which the acquisition will be there for the North European plain, which is farmland in Poland. He wanted to redistribute that to German farmers, kick the Poles out, move the Germans in, which is what they're going to do after the 1939 invasion. And then Obviously, all of this is going to lead up. And in Mein Kampf, he talks about this, the importance of taking out France. Uh, and so he, he outlines that in Mein Kampf. He also outlines the invasion of Russia. Because remember, Hitler looked at communists as the ultimate enemy to fascism and to just freedom abroad or whatever. You know, he, he would kind of go into it. Because remember, Hitler is a guy who does talk about freedom and does talk about uh, liberty in a sense that's slightly different, right? We think of that in American context, like right to bear arms, freedom of speech. Uh, for Hitler and the fascist, it's the right to work, the right to live. And so there's an economic component in that. And so let's keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. And Hitler is immensely popular. Uh, and so in March of 1938, Hitler is going to attempt to take over Austria. Now he's going to do this using uh, kind of a political tool of annexation. And so there's going to be a number of different little referendum votes all around Austria. Austria is one of the founding places where the Nazi party is really, really large. And so there are a number of Austrians who go right along with this and do accept annexation annexation. And the picture that, that you obviously see here, that picture shows you Hitler going through the streets of Vienna uh, with a parade. And this is not an invasion of military force. Uh, the Nazis go into Austria in a celebration. They're going to end the depression. They're going to bring back the German Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, if you will, from, from back in the Middle Ages. And so that's the idea that people have. And when Britain and France, who are very much attuned to this, when they start to ask questions, Hitler's like, look, you don't worry about that. That's German problem. When German problems are, are British problems, then maybe we'll worry. But right now, these are just German issues. And that German issue by, by the end of 1938 is going to be a whole lot bigger because Hitler is going to go after the Sudetenland. Now, the Sudetenland is an area right on the rim of Czech, the Czech Republic, current day Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia of 1938. And this is a primarily German area of that country at that time. And so you had primarily German residents. And Hitler said, they need to be called back to the fatherland. This should be our territory. It also happened to be where a lot of the natural resource reserves and coal reserves were in, in Czechoslovakia. And so Hitler wants that territory. And this is going to create this huge argument. And Britain and France are now enraged by this. And they're saying, you can't do that. If you do it, we'll go to war. Well, Hitler obviously does not believe this because it hasn't happened yet. And so Hitler is going to basically just say, you know, let's all meet, right? And so he invites them to Munich, Germany, where they're going to have a meeting about the annexation of the Sudetenland. And in that that meeting, you know, the British and the French both kind of leave 
you know, kind of believing Hitler. And, and there's always the joke that you see where, you know, Hitler's talking to him, has his fingers crossed behind his back because he's just lying. And what Hitler tells them is that, you know, all your countries are built on nationalism. Your countries are built on uniting your groups of people. That's all I want for Germany. All I want is the Sudetenland. I'm not going to touch the rest of Czechoslovakia. And that's kind of the agreement they leave with. Neville Chamberlain, right, the prime minister of England, uh, obviously he gets credited with the dumbest quote probably in all of the 20th century. Uh, that quote is, is, is very straightforward. He says, now we have peace in our time. Hitler is a man we can do business with. And if you could think of a worse quote in the 20th century, it's really hard to find one because he just looks like an idiot less than a, a year and a half after this, really a couple of months after this, because the agreement gave Hitler the Sudetenland, gave Germany this territory, but Hitler is then going to invade the rest of Czechoslovakia by the end of 1938. And they're going to be harsh. This is not like the Austrian invasion. They're going to, they're going to put down you know, dissidents. They're going to kill a lot of different people in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so, I mean, it, this is a, a very violent put down. And we also see the imprisonment of all their Jewish, uh, you know, all the, the Jewish citizens living in those areas. And we start to see labor camps develop and things of that nature. And so that's going to be the, the big thing that Hitler does there. And these countries then all of a sudden, Britain and France are like enraged by by this and Neville Chamberlain's like we still shouldn't go to war but if you do anything else we're probably going to go to war now in that same year at the end of 1938 Hitler gets awarded Time Magazine's Man of the Year now on the internet which is, you know, obviously this is on the internet, but uh, sometimes I, I see random people who share things like, see, look at this, Time Magazine celebrated Hitler. That's not what it's about. And if you actually go read that article from Time Magazine um, called The Symphony of Hate, it's about how Adolf Hitler is essentially just maniacal and how he, he's doing a lot of evil things at the time. And so important to kind of recognize what that article is actually about and that Hitler is actually being criticized throughout that. Time Magazine's Man of the Year is given out to basically the most relevant news person person of that year. They don't have to be a great person. You know, Gandhi got it. Hitler got it. So, I mean, like, there's two big differences in people, right? Pope John Paul II got it. Osama bin Laden got it, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of differences in how you can get this. Uh, but Adolf Hitler, Time Magazine, Man of the Year. Now, the, the year itself is going to also kind of bring in another agreement. As 1939 goes around, Hitler begins to really rally support for the invasion of Poland. Now, the German people are not like as war-hungry as we often think, but keep in mind, Hitler controls all of the news outlets and all of the radio. And so, from a nightly basis and a daily basis in the papers, uh, you're going to see anti-Polish news reports and you're going to see Joseph Goebbels go on, on radio all the time and talk about the Polish problem and how the Poles are discriminating against Germans living in Poland and how the Poles are, are amassing troops on the border. In fact, when, when the German soldiers are being trained, they're told in, you know, right before the invasion of Poland that every Polish citizen is a threat and that they'll slit your, slit your throat in the middle of the night. And, and they kind of make them out to be these evil, like subhuman demons, right? And so that there's, a, there's a, a fervor to go to war with Poland. Um, now, before that war even happens, though, Hitler is going to make a deal with Joseph Stalin, which again, we talked about this in the other video, hilarious because they hate each other. Stalin hates Hitler. Hitler hates Stalin. They both know it. And so it's kind of like they're enemies, but they both want part of Poland. Stalin wants to kind of expand the Soviet Union, and Hitler obviously wants that part of Germany, but does not want, want a war with Russia at all yet. He does plan on it eventually, but he doesn't want it yet. And so Hitler and Stalin are going to make an agreement here called the, the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact of 1939, where the Soviets will agree to invade Poland after Hitler invades. And so they also agree to not bash it uh, you know, in the media and everything else, because everybody else is, is probably going to declare war. And Hitler actually honestly probably doesn't think France and Britain will declare war after this anyway. Um, now, the invasion of Poland is interesting because it's, in a lot of ways, it's an experimental invasion um, because you have Hermann Goring, right? Hermann Goring is in charge of the Luftwaffe. Uh, then you have the Panzer Corps, right? And then you have the army. Now, uh, a misconception is that Germany's army is mechanized. They're not mechanized like the U.S. Army. They don't move all their soldiers using trucks. They march a lot of them. They, they still use a lot of horses to move their artillery. And so they're not fully 
mechanized like we are, but this is probably the most mechanized we've seen an army this large be in human history at the time. And so the invasion of Poland is in a lot of ways a resource check. How much gas do you need to invade Poland? How much, you know, how many bombs do you need to level a city? This hadn't been done before by the Germans. And Hermann Goring is going to convince Hitler that the Luftwaffe, if gone in first, can destroy and decimate the Polish defenses and demoralize the civilians. And that's going to be really what happens. And the invasion of Poland, you know, you had to have a reason. And so there are a couple of different reasons they give, just like the Japanese gave with the invasion of China. The, in, the reason for the invasion of, of, of Poland is crazy because what they do is they take some you know, prisoners. These are like communists and dissidents that the, the Nazis had, had imprisoned, and they dress them up in Polish military uniforms, and they have them uh, kind of stand next to this uh, military installation on the border of Poland and Germany and they shoot them and they kill them and they take pictures and they send it off to the newsreels and everything else and it's the Polish attacking German soldiers and of course just like in US history whenever we think that, our, that we're being attacked we lash out and so that's how the German people really supported it. So World War II for the United States starts in 1941 December 7th with Pearl Harbor but for Poland and for Europe and for more or less most of the world it started on September 1st 1939 uh, with the German invasion uh, of Poland. And it starts off with aerial bombardment. Uh, Goring is completely correct. He is going to bomb, 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 bomb. Uh, in, in fact, the, the city of Wellam was the first city bombed. Uh, they hit a whole apartment complex when they do it. Over 1,400 people die in that bombing, which only lasts for uh, under 30 minutes. And the, they also bomb all of the Polish air installations. The Polish didn't have a lot of airplanes, uh, but they have virtually none after the first day of combat. The other thing they hit were the Polish or, uh, Polish armor. Poland did not have a lot of, of tanks in general, but they're mostly destroyed in the first couple of hours of fighting. The Polish army is going to be routed very quickly. Within a, within a week, almost the whole army is routed. Now, some of the misnomers that I always get is guys talk about, oh, well, you know, the, the, the Polish, yeah, they lost because they rode horses against tanks in combat. And good God, could that be any more wrong, but actually right at the same time, because what the Polish actually did and where that kind of story comes from is the Polish had an elite commando unit that did ride horses and they were actually very, very effective. They held the Germans off for three weeks. They were in small units. They used anti-tank weapons. They used, you know, you know, basically like explosives and everything else. They had machine guns and they did ride horses. Now they didn't do a cavalry charge against tanks. That's ludicrous. Uh, what they did is they ambushed German soldiers as they marched and and it took very, pretty much to the end of the, 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 the invasion for them to kind of capitulate and surrender. Now, what made this so effective was the blitz, right? The lightning war. So you have the planes that come in and then in tandem, you have the armor, right? The artillery, the tanks that come in and then the infantry comes in after to clean up the, you know, everything else. And it just completely overwhelmed the Polish army. The speed in which the Germans moved actually surprised everyone, including Stalin, who knew they were invading, but then was like, they're not going to get that far that quick. And they were almost about to take over all of Poland when Stalin's like, oh man, we better actually invade. Uh, the German invasion, which was 1.1 million soldiers, is remarkably quick. The only thing that really kind of slows them down are gas issues and kind of communication issues. And these are things they need to fix before they invade France. Uh, but that's what they're going to do. And so it, it's kind of interesting. When the Russians come in, the Russians are not nearly as organized as the Germans when it comes to using planes and using tanks. And so it's more of an overwhelming of numbers. And so there's this great quote from a German commander uh, who says, the Russians have distracted the Polish from us, but fight so poorly that it's a wonder why we ever made a deal with them in the first place. And, and it kind of sums up how they felt about the Russians. They looked at the Russians' participation in Poland. And they say, wow, this is going to be easy. But boy, are they wrong, right? Because the Russian front is one of the most violent. It is probably, I think it's hard to find anything more violent in human history than the German-Russian front in World War II. And so, you know, they did underestimate them and it did kind of, you know, really bite Germany in the butt later on in the war. And it's arguably the reason why they lost. Now, uh, the Polish are going to end up surrendering, obviously. Uh, it, it takes all the way until October, but they will surrender. Warsaw is going to be uh, more or less destroyed. They bomb Warsaw until they surrender. And, and that's the thing. The Polish government could not withstand the civilian casualties that the Germans were willing to inflict. And that's ultimately why they surrendered. Uh, and ultimately why the Germans were able to win and be successful uh, going forward. Now, as the as the Polish surrendered, uh, Britain and France do declare war on Germany, but Hitler kind of laughs because they don't do anything. One, Britain didn't have soldiers in Europe, so they're trying to amass all of their soldiers and get them into Europe on time. France 
fights a couple little border skirmishes, but more or less says, you know what, we're going to wait behind the Maginot Line. And the Maginot Line is a series of fortifications along the German and French border, and then some static fortifications along the Belgian border, um, which is kind of ironic because the German invasion in 1871 went through Belgium, in 1914 it went through Belgium, and in 1940 it's going to go through Belgium, and the French still weren't prepared for it. But that'll be the next lesson because really, I think we spent a lot of time on Poland, and we're going to spend an equal amount of time on the invasion of France and, and, and the, the blitz of Britain. So until next time, Mr. Arvitus, uh, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Uh, please feel free to contact me, email me guys if you have any questions.